Good morning. We got everybody who's been over at the senior center getting lined up and ready for the soup and sandwich we got starting at 11 o'clock. And, and uh, it'll be a good, good time and a good meal over there. Uh, we're going to wish a happy 100th birthday to Heritus Iverson. It's tomorrow. 101. Oh, well, what's one more year when you're 100? <laughs> yeah. But that's good. So anyway, uh, happy 101st birthday to, to Heritus that way. Um, our opening hymn this morning is number 684, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness. Wind, wind on the sea. 
Increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our first reading for this morning is from the Old Testament prophet Amos, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, and 10 through 15. Amos writes, Seek the Lord and live. Or he will sweep through the house of Joseph like a fire. It will devour, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. You who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground, you who hate the one who reproves in court and despise him who tells the truth, you trample on the poor and force him to give you grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. You oppress the righteous and take bribes and you deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent man keeps quiet in such times for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord, the Almighty, will be with you just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good. Maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Here ends our first reading. Our second reading is again today from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews is one of those books that we're not really sure who wrote. You know, it's one of those, I can't really say it was written by Paul or anything that way, just that it was written to the, to the Hebrew people. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to, to whom we must give account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. 
Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Here ends our second lesson. Our gospel for today is from the gospel of Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 17. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable standing for the reading. Mark writes, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then, come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, No one who has left home, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or fields for me, and the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them, persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated as we sing hymn number 713, Lord, let my heart be good soul. Lord, let my heart be good soul. Open to the seed of your word. Lord, let my heart be good soil, where love can grow and peace is understood. When my heart is hard, break the stone away. When my heart is cold, warm it with the day. When my heart is lost, lead me on your asking God to open our hearts to hear his word and then for his word to be able to grow within us. This gospel reading from Mark today with this rich young man coming and calling Jesus good to begin with, and he's right, Jesus is good, we know that. But Jesus says no one is good but God. And we know that too, that God is good. You know, we, we praise God for his goodness, for his glory, for his grace. 
But this young man asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And it's a question that many people have asked. And I know I've shared with you before, and, but Clifford, Cheryl's uncle, asked me one time, Russ, how do you know if, you have, if you're saved? How do you know you're going to go to heaven? And I have no idea what I answered. And he looked at me and he said, just believe it. You know, simple, just believe it. You know, but, and, and in Mark's gospel it says, you know, all who are baptized and believe, or all who believe and are baptized shall be saved. And it, you know, it isn't baptism that saves us, it's belief. It's the belief in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And as Jesus looked at this man, you know, that came and asked him that, this, this young man was just, he was, he was perplexed. He didn't know what to do when Jesus said to him, you know, go sell all your wealth and, and give it to the poor. And, you know, because he had lived a good life. He, had, he knew the commandments and he had followed them. Isn't that enough? But Jesus said, you need to have your heart in the right place. You need to have your priorities straight. You need to not count on all of this wealth that you have. Not that wealth is bad, but, you know, you need to let your heart be good soil, as we just sang. You need to be aware of other people and their needs. And he says to his disciples, you know, it's easier for... Something just came crashing from somewhere. Oh, and because all of a sudden there was a silver deal that came <laughs> blowing up here. And, okay, well, with that puzzle is solved. It's one of those, but, but eternal life. I mean, who gets eternal life? And how do we get it? That's another puzzle, you know. I hope you can get the puzzle put back together back there. A little humor is always good for the soul, you know. But, you know, this, this young man, he asked this question, how, what do I got to do? What do I have to do? How can I have eternal life? What, how can I guarantee it? You know, and Jesus says, you got to live a life that is full. You got to live a life that, that shows that you pay attention to community. You can't just count on your wealth. But I mean, wealth was and is still considered a little bit of a, a sign of blessing and we all work and we want to have wealth and there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of wealth and having some wealth isn't going to hinder us from getting into heaven I mean but what what would hinder us from getting into heaven would be cons being so appreciative of our wealth being so consumed by our wealth and focusing on it thinking that that was the all, you know, just to get more, to have more, rather than to say that I have enough that I can share with others. So it isn't wealth itself that, that can keep us from getting into heaven, but it's letting wealth, letting possessions, letting our, our pride and, and who we are get in the way of just that simple faith and trust in God knowing that God is gracious and God is good. And even if we give everything we have to the poor, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get to heaven either. Because Jesus says it's impossible for anybody to get to heaven on their own. There is no way that any one of us can live a life good enough so that we can get into heaven. The only way we get to heaven is by God's grace. And, you know, it's God's grace, God's forgiveness that, that gives us that entry into heaven. It's like Clifford said, to believe it. To believe that God is gracious and merciful. To believe that God forgives us. To believe that God is a loving parent. To believe that God is what we need in our lives. To know that on our own, I mean, there's just nothing that I can do to pay for my sins. All the sacrifices I might do, everything I might do for others, it still leaves me a sinner in need of God's grace, in need of God's love and forgiveness. This very, yeah, very idea of our salvation 
is in the word justified. We are justified by our faith. And the other night, a confirmation, I, I shared with the kids that were there that Pastor Arden Norm, when I was in eighth grade, taught me that, taught us that the word justification, or justified, to look at it as just as if I had never sinned. And I'm sure I've shared that before too. But so this 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 faith that we have from God, this this being justified, means that we're made acceptable to God. I mean, if if we were to be if God looked at us for all of our sin, for, I mean, the darkness that's within us, and it is. Each and every one of us is a sinner. Each and every one of us has evil within us. We can't help that. If God was to look at that part of our lives, we wouldn't be acceptable to God. When Jesus takes that sin, he takes that evil, he takes that darkness out of our lives, he justifies us. He makes us look like we are acceptable to him. And just... Just because God does it all doesn't mean that that we can just sit back and do nothing. Just because you know God is a loving and gracious God and we're justified by our faith without any real advantages to how good a life we live or how much we care for other people. It's you know, it doesn't it doesn't mean that we can just keep on sinning. We we don't we don't keep on sinning so that God's grace can be magnified. We don't do that. We try to we try to live a life that's better. When Jesus goes into that room or wherever with just his disciples and he's talking with them again about this question, they ask that question too, and of course they're pretty confident because they've left everything behind, you know. The fishermen left their nets, left them out, their fathers and and their brothers left everything behind to follow Jesus. So they say, well, we left. Peter especially says, well, we left everything, Lord. We're following you. We, we're sure to get to heaven. And Jesus reminds them that, you know, sometimes it's, you know, the last will be first and the first will be last. You know, it isn't. Things on earth are different than things in heaven. And he's, he makes this comparison that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And I've heard a lot of different explanations about that, but I remember when I was seventh or eighth grade, something like that, I had a baseball that the cover was coming off. And I got this curved needle and I got this thread, you know, to thread in there. And I remember struggling to get that thread through the needle. And, and some of you have sewn a couple buttons or different things, and you know what it is to put the thread through the needle. It's not always easy. You can lick it and get it, you know, and, pull it and get it just, and it still hits it and it doesn't want to go through. And so, I mean, if you've ever tried to thread a needle, you know that that can be difficult. And they've got little deals now that are called threaders that go through the needle, you put the thread in, you pull it back out, makes it a little bit easier, but you still got to get that through that eye of that needle. And as we get older, it's not as easy to thread that needle with whatever it is. But I remember working with that needle and not having quite enough thread to get the job done. So you gotta start over again. And, the, the, and maybe that doesn't have anything to do with what Jesus said either, but you know, we can start out doing okay, but we can get lost. We can get lost on our way. And that's, I kind of think that with, with this rich young ruler, you know, he, he probably was doing okay, but then he got caught up in his wealth. And he got caught up in and it's mine. And, and that's the wrong mindset, that it's mine. Not that we have to give everything away. There, there's, it doesn't say that at all, but that we don't have to give everything away. But to be aware of, of others, to, to reach out, to share, and to have that compassion is, is a good start on things. And it doesn't mean that, that God doesn't know what we do. I mean, we, we can't make ourselves perfect in God's eyes. But God knows what we do do. And, and so that doesn't make God love us more. But it, it keeps us on our right track. It keeps our hearts and minds in that position of being that good soil in that song that we sang. It, it's, it's God's love that 
that comes to us each and every day. And it's God, God's grace. And it's only by God's grace that we are forgiven. It's only by God's grace that we have any hope of getting into heaven. And, and it's that, that grace of God is what justifies us. It's that grace of God that, that tells us that we are loved and forgiven sinners. It's that grace of God that enables us to say, you know, I may not have enough to help everybody that was hurt by that hurricane, or I may not have enough hay to help all of the farmers in the western part of North Dakota that lost hay and need feed for their cattle, or those that lost so much in the fires out in Wyoming or fires that are north of Bismarck, you know, now even. I can't help every one of those people, but I can help some. And that's the, that's the mindset that God wants us to do. God doesn't expect us to do everything. But God hopes, God encourages us to do something, you know, rather than just do nothing, but to do something. And when we do something, even if it's maybe just a little thing for us, it can make a big difference for a lot of other people. It's just like boxes of clothing that are getting collected and be sent down to the hurricane victims. We had two big hurricanes come through. And before the second hurricane, there were tornadoes that did tremendous damage in Florida. Well, we can't fix any and all of that by ourselves. But coming together as a country, coming together as God's people, sharing a little bit of what we have can make a difference in someone's life. And that's what Jesus is saying to this rich young man that comes. You don't have to give, he, he does say give everything because this man was just full of himself. But I don't know if Jesus really meant that to this young man either, that he had to give everything. But he had to be aware of the world. He had to be aware of the needs of other people rather than just focusing on himself. And as Timothy writes, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's the love of money. It's the love of possessions. It's the hoarding of what we have rather than the sharing and hoping that we can help others in their needs as well. So it's a, it's a time in our lives that, that you know, when, when we ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What, what must I do to know that I'm going to go to heaven? The short and simple answer, like Clifford said, just believe it. And when we believe it, when we believe it, James writes that we are, we are doers of the word. It isn't enough just to believe. But James says that our, our works are a result of our faith. Our works are a result of, of the grace that God gives us. But it doesn't mean that our works save us. Our works are just a thank you. Our sharing, our giving, our welcoming others is just a part of the way we say thank you to God for his love and for his grace. And so this, this young man comes with that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gives him an impossible task. Give everything away. Impossible. And the disciples asked, well then who can be saved? For God God could save everybody. He may or he may not. We don't know that. But for God, for any one of us to be saved, it's an act of God. It's not anything that we do on our own. We don't deserve God's grace, not for a minute. It's an act of grace, love, and mercy that we as forgiven sinners trust, we believe, that we will be going to heaven. It's a simple gift from God. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen. We continue as we sing our offering response. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be, all that
time we're going to bow our heads and, and pray for the people of the world and for all people according to their needs. Let's bow our heads and pray. Gracious God, as I mentioned, we think about the people that have been impacted by the hurricanes, by the fires, by the floods that are caused by the hurricanes, by the tornadoes that are spurred from the hurricanes. So much devastation, so many people in so much need. So, Lord, we pray that not only those of us right here, but for all people in our world and especially here in the United States, that our hearts may be open to be able to, to help in whatever manner we can, to give some of what we have. It's kind of like the lesson that we learned from the gospel today. You know, we need to not everything for ourselves but we need to be able to share to be gracious so help us Lord to reach out to them and I pray Lord for all of those that are impacted it, it may seem hopeless to them that everything is gone their homes their cars their food their you know everything their livelihood some of them may not have electricity for months places to stay so, Lord, help us as a nation, as a world, to come together to work to help all of those that are in so much need. And while we're thinking of those big needs, help us also to remember our local needs, that there are people in our local areas that, that need clothing for their children, that need food to be put on their table. So when we look at the big picture, let's not forget the small stuff either and those that are close to our home and closer to our hearts we continue to pray for our country and our leaders for our military for our police officers our firefighters so many that give of themselves all of those who work in the medical field from from the least to the greatest you know it doesn't matter who they are they all have an impact and it doesn't matter who any of us is in life, but we can all have an impact on others. Well, Lord, we pray for those in our medical profession that they may be able to make the proper diagnosis and, and find the new cures and proper medications. So we pray today again for Shirley and Dean and Sue and Nolan and Bob and Gloria, Maxine, Jeannie, Mary, Beth, Barb, Alan, Lori, Shauna. Pray for Connie. We pray for Herodice as she celebrates her birthday tomorrow, that, that she continues to be able to enjoy life. Lord, there are so many blessings that we have that, that we kind of seem, seem to gloss over sometimes and forget the blessings we have of family and home and food and so much. So help our hearts to be thankful. And Lord, I know yesterday was a day that set aside as a Farmer's Appreciation Day. And they're a group that we need to be appreciative of every day. And many of them in our area right now are still in the midst of soybean harvest and other beans and other harvesting to come. So watch over them, bless them with good common sense and help them get the rest that they need and, and work safely in an environment that is not always a safe environment to live. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In this day and always, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you with grace and mercy. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 
Our closing hymn this morning is number 723, The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve.